I'm happy actually to get questions during the talk, okay? Because I'm talking about a different topic than you heard about the last few days, because I'm not talking about scattering SNOM. Zero scattering SNOM in this talk, okay? We do scattering SNOM, but I'm going to talk about photocurrent using uh, the SNOM. And uh, I want to actually first start with introducing what this actually means, photocurrent nanoscopy. And it's actually easier to explain photocurrent nanoscopy than it's to explain photocurrent. Because photocurrent actually means I shine light on a system and a current is generated, right? But then the question is, where is the light shining on the sample? Because it's shining everywhere. So it's actually very complicated, right? Because photons are hitting everywhere and it's generating uh, at, at these different locations uh, electric fields and currents and everything, and then there's a total current. So photocurrent is, is, is actually difficult to understand in detail. Photocurrent nanoscopy is easier to understand because there's only one place where I uh, shine light, okay? Of course, there's you know, light coming from far field, but for now, just let's assume there's just a local light source, okay? And that comes, of course, from the SNOM tip that is illuminated by, uh, by light, which can be visible light, infrared light, or terahertz. Now, yes, this thing is a little... <clears throat> What happens is actually four things. First, the incoming radiation generates some excitation. Here I put electron hole pairs because that's the simplest way of uh, how a photon can be absorbed. But as we see later, the incoming radiation with a tip, right, can also generate plasmons, right, or polaritons. Uh, or heat, or whatever, right? But it creates something, okay? Some excitation in the system. Then this excitation uh, can do potentially nothing, but it can also potentially locally create an electric field. Different mechanisms, I will explain this. It generates some electric field. When that electric field is generated, and you actually see it here in this picture, um, this electric field starts to drive currents in the system. And um, some of these currents, and they're shown here in these red lines, and this is actually a calculation, so it's a beautiful image, thanks to Mark Lundeberg, uh, but it's actually a calculation of what happens. Um, some of these currents start actually just circulating, and nobody knows about those. Okay, I cannot measure them. But some of these currents actually make it all the way to the metallic contacts, and when I measure now the current, just with my current meter, from this contact to this contact, I actually will measure this, okay? So, locally, something happens at a scale of like, you know, 10, 20 nanometers, but these contacts can really be far away, microns or even millimeters far away, and I can still measure this effect. So some of these field lines, uh, these current field lines will always make it into the contacts. So that, that is actually quite special, so we also call it like non-local probing, and you can actually even use very large devices um, and probe photocurrents uh, and make them, by moving the tip, make them images of the photocurrent nanoscopy and learn about the system. So um, I just wanted to uh, go back in time, I, I did this actually yesterday, I, no, I, I, no, it's not completely true because we cited these papers, uh, um, but I was looking at them again, because photocurrent nanoscopy is not new, uh, it was already done back in 1996, mostly with visible light, and, and um, it was initially used to look at solar cells, okay, to understand how... Um, currents and voltages are generated in, in solar cells, right? Uh, here is work from uh, 96, where they look at spectra. So uh, they, they use different excitation energies and then try to understand at which location uh, photocurrent was generated. Then there is work from uh, uh, a couple of years later, where they looked at spatial profiles and they tried to understand the effect of defects and they could, you know, basically overlay the AFM, uh, which has different um, 
uh, corrugations and at those corrugations there is also a stronger generation of photoresponse. Uh, and then there is uh, work a couple of years later where they looked at nanowires and they could look uh, at the photoresponse that was always taking place near the contacts. So this is um, SEM image and this is the photoresponse and you can see some signal near the contacts. Okay, so <clears throat> then um, we took it uh, basically later on to two-dimensional materials where uh, infrared and terahertz light uh, creates a much more rich spatial uh, profile that led us to you know, learn a lot more about the system, the basic physical properties, but also uh, polaritons. Now, um, this is actually a, a recent review paper, um, <clears throat> thanks to the leadership of Justin Song, that is highlighting Ah, nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what kind of things you can do with photocurrent? Okay, so this is a very busy uh, image. Um, but basically, it's called a multi-physics diagnostic tool of quantum materials. Okay, and this includes photocurrent in general, which means just far-field photocurrent and near-field photocurrent. Right here, the tip is even shown here. Um, and you can learn about different phases in this process that I discussed before, right? So, so you can learn about the absorption process and, 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 and basically perform spectroscopy. You can learn about current generation mechanisms. There are many uh, current generation mechanisms, right? There's, there's the thermoelectric effects and photovoltaic effects. Uh, this image is actually showing topological effects. This, this color here is showing the uh, Berry curvature of the system. So you can learn about the topological uh, uh, phenomena and quantum geometry, etc. In, in quantum materials. You can also learn about dynamics in the system if you do this time resolved, relaxation dynamics, uh, dynamics of, of how carriers move in the system. Um, and then by making spatial maps, you can also uh, learn about spatial profiles in the system uh, uh, through, through the current collection uh, behavior. Right? So all of the steps in a photocurrent generation mechanism are interesting and relevant. It makes uh, interpretation of your data also sometimes challenging, so you really need to think really what, what you are probing actually, which of these aspects you're probing. Yeah. Okay, so, so uh, here I'm just listing a couple of things we can learn from the system, right? And there's a longer list. So uh, we can learn about polaritons, and, uh, and specifically, we initially started this with terahertz because for terahertz, uh, scattering SNOM is more challenging because of the detector efficiency. Uh, so initially, we used actually photocurrents to measure terahertz polaritons. Um, we can learn about moiré, moiré on twisted two-dimensional materials uh, because they have spatial profile on how the photocurrent is generated. So we can look inside the moiré unit cell. Um, and, and, and also the correlation effects in the moiré. Um, the, um, you can look at charge distributions in, in your device. Uh, I mentioned already before, you can look in topological material, uh, topological properties like the quantum geometry. Currently, we're looking at correlated states in twisted graphene, which we can even see in photocurrent nanoscopy. And perhaps there's also interesting stuff in superconductors. Dimitri is also working on that. I think there it's still the question what is actually happening there. Um, but this list probably goes on while we try different things. In many of these cases, we, we basically just try it. So we put in a sample, we measure photocurrent nanoscopy, and see if something cool appears, right? And I think Dimitri has the same strategy. And then afterwards, we try to explain. Uh, in, in, in most of the cases, most of the data I showed, the N nothing was predicted, okay? Um, <clears throat> then, uh, okay, so what I'm going to do now is to focus a little bit on graphene because it's a, a bit easier to explain the, the mechanism, it's well understood. Uh, and, uh, and then I will again mention different systems. So in graphene you have different photo detection mechanisms. Um, uh, uh, for example, photothermoelectric effect, where basically heat generates a voltage. You can have bolometric effects, where heat 
changes the conductivity of the system. You have photovoltaic effects where electron and hole pairs are separated, like in semiconductors. And then there is in terahertz also more exotic effects like Giacon of Shore, I will not discuss. But let's just have a look at these two. Um, I think you're very much familiar with photovoltaic effects. And this is actually very common in semiconductors, right? A photon generates electron and hole. There's an electric field. And this electric field separates the hole from the electron. Okay, and that generates current. This uh, is strong in semiconductors. It's actually very weak in graphene. Why? Because you're not asking questions, so I'm going to ask you questions. Yes, why is, it, why is this weak in graphene? Yeah. There's no band gap, exactly. There's no band gap, so what happens? So the, so the electron and holes basically just immediately recombine. Yeah. Yeah. There's no gap. So they, they, they don't need to lose energy uh, by emitting a photon or a phonon. So they, they basically immediately find each other. Okay? So, the, so, so, so they, they, they relax very quickly to the bottom of the band, right? Uh, and here as well. When I create an electron somewhere there at high energy, it goes very quickly to the bottom of the band. Same thing with a hole, goes quickly to the bottom of the band. If these two bands are touching each other, like in graphene, the electrons in the hole just find each other. Okay? So uh, this is actually the picture of graphene. So if I create electron and hole, they immediately find each other. They can go to the bottom of the band. Now, um, is everything lost? No. Because what is preserved in graphene when I shine light is actually that the electrons do get a bit hotter. So even if the electrons and holes recombine, what happens, so here this is now actually a picture of the Fermi-Dirac distribution. And you can see the Fermi energy in graphene is not um, very sharply defined anymore. It's actually smeared out a bit. And the more light I shine on the system, the hotter it gets. Okay? But it's not the phonons, it's actually the electrons that are hot. Yeah? And, and, and th this is a very simple picture, just to understand that the, this Fermi Dirac distribution is smeared out a bit. Now, this electronic heat can generate a voltage through the photothermoelectric effect, which is basically also called a Seebeck effect. And that happens when I have a, a difference in Seebeck coefficient. And let me explain that. So let's go back to the thermoelectric effect, which I think you all know very well. You have two different materials um, that have a different photo thermo that have a different thermoelectric coefficient, uh, also called Seebeck coefficient. And then, if uh, there's a temperature difference between the two, then a voltage is generated. Okay, and that, that's very simple, shown in this equation, right? A delta T and a delta S leads to a voltage. So I, in this case, two different materials. That's just the, the standard classical thermoelectric effect that you learn about in high school. Now, in, in uh, two-dimensional materials, I don't need two different materials. I can do it with the same The only thing is, I can, uh, to make a different Seebeck, I just uh, have a different doping. I use different doping. Okay, so I have graphene, for example. In region one, I have... Um, uh, P-type doping, okay, the Fermi energy here is below the Dirac point, and then on the right side, I have N-type doping. It gives me a PN junction. Um, but I don't even need a PN junction, I just need different doping, okay? That I can do with a gate. So graphene, you can, you can gate, so the, this is a simple picture of that geometry, so this is graphene with contacts. On the bottom, this is doped silicon. I apply a voltage between the two, and that changes the doping in the graphene. Right? Um, <clears throat> so basically, if I do that, uh, I can plot now the Fermi energy as a function of voltage. On the left side, I, I get hole doping. Then there is no doping in the middle. And on the right side, there's electron doping. That's a typical gating of graphene. But now I can do this in two different regions. Okay? So I can do this with two different gates. Um, or initially, uh, worked at we did back in 2011, is actually just to have a narrow top gate in, in combination with a back gate. Okay? And then you can get two different regions. So on, on the top gate, the doping is different 
from you know to the left of the top gate or to the right of the top gate, and then that gives a difference in seaback coefficient, and that can lead to a photothermoelectric effect. So this is initially this is not nanos photocurrent nanoscopy, right? This is just photocurrent, where you you basically uh, focus the beam as good as you can and then scan it over the device, and then the, you obtain this kind of photocurrent image. So this is basically the current generated in the system as a function of laser spot position. And you can see these spots here, uh, and, and those are actually taking place exactly where the Seebeck coefficient um, has the strongest gradient, right? So there's Seebeck is large here and smaller here, and so there's a large difference in Seebeck exactly at this junction. Okay. Let me ask any questions because if this is not clear, then the rest of the lecture is just useless. You can just go for coffee. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Adrian has a question. Yeah. How large? I mean, I don't see any scale bar. Ah, sorry. Yeah. Of course, nanoscopy people want to always scale scale bars. This is done with a, a visible light laser. This is a 10 micron or something like that. So everything is big here, right? There is no nanoscopy, this focused light, and then these spots are also quite uh, big, right? How long does it take to, to record such an such a image, let's say? Oh, uh, that's quite quick, a few minutes, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay, so th this can be understood in, in a simple picture, right? So I have uh, graphene with, with slightly different doping, okay? Uh, and, and therefore, the seabag is different. And then if I shine light on the system, I create some hot electrons. I just draw them here now as, as excited electrons. Um, and then a current starts to flow from here to here. Okay? And, and that is called the photothermoelectric effect. Um, this is the equation. So the current is basically the integral of the electric field that's generated. And then the electric field that is generated is basically the Seebeck coefficient times the gradient of the temperature. I will go in more detail because in reality it's a bit more complicated. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, this Seebeck coefficient in graphene has a specific form. Um, and, and you can calculate it with a, what is called the MOT equation. This is actually a generic equation that you can apply to any material. Um, it has some prefactors. Then it has G is the conductivity of the system. And what you need is basically the conductivity derivative over the, over the uh, Fermi energy in the system. Uh, but I can also just write it here as a derivative of the conductivity of the gate voltage, right? Which, which changes the Fermi energy. Why I do that? Because then I can actually look at uh, a simple conductivity measurement. So reminder again, right? If I measure the conductivity in graphene as a function of gate voltage, I have low conductivity when the Fermi energy is at the Dirac point, right? And then on the left side here, I have hole doping, so the conductivity goes up. On the right side, I have electron doping, conductivity goes up. So this is a conductivity of graphene. I take the derivative. And then I get something like this, right? And that's the Seebeck coefficient. This is the predicted Seebeck coefficient, but you can also then calculate it, and, and it always, uh, almost always uh, agrees perfectly. So it's, it's a little bit, for graphene, the Seebeck is a little bit wild, right? It goes up, then it goes down again, changes sign, and then up again. So it's, it's non-monotonic. Um, it leads to uh, so some interesting behavior. <clears throat> but for the nanoscopy, you don't even care too much about this. Okay? The only thing you know, that you see clearly at the Dirac point, it changes sign. And we'll see this uh, in, in our images. Um, so th this is work from MIT where they uh, measured the photoresponse now with two gates, uh, basically to go through all the configurations, right? Means left side P-type doped, right side N-type doped, or NP, or PP, and NN, right? So then you can make a whole matrix of all the different configurations. 
And um, what you see here is that the sign of the photocurrent is changing s several times. So it's positive here, negative here, back to positive, negative again, positive, negative. And the reason is exactly because of this funky shape of the Seebeck coefficient, right? Now, I'm showing this because this was actually proof that um, the photothermoelectric effect is dominant here because you can actually uh, look at the system. There's an electric field pointing to the right, and the photovoltaic uh, current would, if there was a photovoltaic effect, right, it would always go in the same direction, right? But actually, there are uh, regimes here where the current is in the opposite direction. Opposite direction is the electric field, so that's proof it's photothermoelectric. <clears throat> and I, I will come back actually to this equation later. Then um, you may wonder also about the, the size here of this uh, response. And, and that's another important parameter in the system, also for nanoscopy. This is not the laser spot size, this is actually the electronic cooling length. This is actually the, the distance that hot electrons can diffuse before they cool down. Right? So let's say you have a local spot now, it heats up electrons. These electrons uh, start cooling, but they also move. So you can imagine that the thermal profile is basically decaying as a function of space. Right? Uh, and that typical length scale is the cooling length. Frank, so, how about the substrate? Do you take into account any substrate? Yes, bits? yes. actually, uh, the cooling length is in many cases dominated by the substrate. So the heat is actually lost uh, into substrate phonons, for example. Because there's also coupling to graphene phonons, this is actually very weak. Um, and, and we have an, a paper which is not in the slides, which shows actually that the cooling to the hyperbolic phonons in, in boronitrite is very strong. So, so actually the hyperbolic character that uh, Pablo was talking about is actually important for the electron cooling. <clears throat> um, why uh, is this important? Because um, uh, it, uh, the, the cooling length here actually, in the end, uh, enters also the equation that I uh, obtained to calculate the spatial profiles of the photocurrents, but I will come back to that. Okay, so I will skip this. Um, I will just mention quickly that in, in graphene, the photothermoelectric effect is strong, not only because the seabag is large, but also because the coupling between electrons and phonons is very weak. Um, so, so that means that the electrons get actually relatively hot. And that's the reason, I think, why this uh, photocurrent nanoscopy works so well. So initially, we started doing that in 2016. We did this on uh, CVD graphene. Um, it's uh, Achim Wusner, some of you know him. And I told him, let's look for plasmons uh, with photocurrent. And with no, no clue that this could actually work. And then he tried for uh, quite some time. And, and didn't see any plasmons, and then we're like, oh, we don't even know why we would see them, so let's forget about it. Uh, but actually, then later on, he did see it. Um, but the mistake was to actually look at CVD graphene, which has a lower mobility. I, I think it's even lower here, 1,000. But the, um, when you do photocurrent nanoscopy on CVD graphene, you see this, okay? So it looks like a mass, right? Uh, the, the edges are here, it's like a, a cross, the contacts are here, and it looks like a mass. Um, that's not because the technique is a mass, it's actually because the material is a mass, okay? So CVD graphene is actually low quality, and if you zoom in, you can see here now all these sign changes, right? And, and um, I mentioned already, the Seebeck coefficient changes sign at the Dirac point. So these are doping variations, positive and negative. And uh, if you look here, you zoom in, you can actually see here domain wall, uh, sorry, grain boundaries in the system, where the, where the, where the system changes also uh, doping. And these are uh, the grains that happens when you grow CVD graphene. We can also measure this as a function of voltage. We can indeed like even flip this sign change by changing the voltage. 
um, and, and, and prove that this is indeed uh, a, a change in uh, carrier polarity. Okay, so why is this useful? Okay, we can see grain boundaries, we can measure the carrier distribution, we can see that it's a messy system. Um, then we go to higher quality graphene. Uh, this is exfoliated graphene, but without boron nitride. Um, if we are now uh, close to charge neutrality, you can see all the puddles here. Electrons and holes, they're randomly distributed, but only at charge neutrality. Okay, This is now a line cut as a function of gate voltage, and exactly charge neutrality, you can see all the puddles, but away from it, it's, it's nicely in uniform. Right? And the charge neutrality, there will actually always be puddles. Uh, it's just in higher quality graphene, this is uh, a, a smaller region, a smaller gate region where this happens. Okay, so we can learn about puddles. Then we look at encapsulated graphene. We could actually see that there is no puddles anymore, but then we saw that near the edges, there are very sharp, um, there's a very sharp photoresponse. Uh, and this has to do with the, uh, sorry, with uh, doping that builds up near the edge that can happen even in HBN encapsulated graphene, and this comes from actually the silicon oxide uh, substrate. So that's why people now actually use metallic local gates to get rid of this uh, oxide effect. Yeah. I see the, the currents are really large compared to the CVD, it's like 100 times higher. Is this for the same voltage? That you apply? Yeah, yeah, they're much larger. Um, it is because this is a, a very well defined junction. Uh, and um, uh, I, I will show later, but basically, we're probing the gradient of the Seebeck coefficient. And if there's a, a very sharp jump in Seebeck, you get a larger photocop. How, how does it compare to a far field measurement? I don't remember the values. It was also nano amperes, but was much higher when, field, when, when, when you uh, showed the very first uh, uh, yeah. large area with the focus. <clears throat> Similar field. numbers, but, 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 but com complete coincidence, right? Because mm, here we basically use still the tapping of the tip and then we use a lock-in to measure the, the photocurrent, right? At that at tapping frequency. So it's completely different from the far field. Yeah. Yeah. And the power at the tip is much lower. But we were surprised that actually the signals are so large, right? Because your uh, local laser spot, yeah, your local hotspot is much smaller, right? Exactly. Than your laser spot. This is surprising, you have to see. Yeah. The values are comparable. Yes. But of course, but the field is enhanced, right? So, okay. Now, um, a little bit about like why uh, does this actually work, right? So I already mentioned that, the, um, that there's multiple steps in the photocurrent generation mechanism. And um, the, um, the, the, the mechanism that you basically locally perturb the system and then globally can probe it is something that goes all the way back from the old days of Shockley who you probably know very well by name, uh, and Shockley and Rameau already predicted uh, non-local photocurrents, which basically um, aligns with this picture that I mentioned before, right? So that you locally perturb the systems and that some of the current lines make it all the way to the contacts. Okay, so I explained this already before. I just wanted to mention here it's called Sh Shockley Rameau. And uh, you can actually find, oh, the reference is gone, but this was initially in a paper by Levitov and uh, Justin Song. Now, um, here I wanted to mention briefly how to now calculate these, these spatial images uh, of the photocurrent. And so the naive way would basically say, oh, let me just take a local source, a local heat source, then I calculate the electric field that is generated by this local heat source. Then I calculate current profiles, and then I integrate over those, and I get a current. And then I have to do this for each spot. So that's a really long calculation. That takes longer than taking the experimental data. Okay? <clears throat> It turns out you can actually use reciprocity in the system. Um, and... Uh, uh, the, there's Mark Lundeberg actually nicely worked this out. There's a paper on the archive 
and it will be on the archive forever because Marco Mark went to, into cryptocurrency uh, and 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 you know he he's not submitting this paper anymore, so we just leave it on the archive. But it's very useful. Um, so what you do is that you basically calculate first equipotential lines. So you basically say, oh, let's let's uh, apply a bias between source and drain, and then look at the voltage distribution. Or you can actually see these lines over how currents would flow. So now I am you know, simulating this system, which I showed you the data before, I just flipped it upside down and showed this data, where there's a bit of doping near the edge. So the current is actually going to flow a bit more near the edge than in the bulk. Okay? Uh, and so these are the equipotential lines. And then uh, by taking the gradient of this equipotential line, you can immediately obtain the photocurrent map. Okay? In one shot. So I don't need to do this tedious process. That's explained in this paper. Uh, here are the equations. Uh, so here you can see the gradient, right, of the, uh, of the voltage, of the equipotential lines. Um, so this is a very powerful way Frank? to calculate photocurrent maps. Yes. A quick question. I mean, now you described the forward way, right? But uh, how would it be the opposite way if you would take the photocurrent map and try to reconstruct all these, um, all the <laughs> potential lines? I mean, it, would there be a unique solution, or is the, would you end up with eventually different? Uh... Um, we do it iteratively. Uh, there are probably more solutions, but some of them are not really physical. So, so we we. Um, we play basically with some Seebeck profile and then iteratively we try to find it, which is a, lo a lot more complicated uh, process. So it's, it's hard to do the inverse of this. Um, so, okay, so, so you can do this, but let me give you a simple equation and I think I showed you this one before, uh, which is more or less an approximation of the system. So the current that is flowing is basically a spatial integral and now make it one dimensional. Okay, it's a spatial integral of the gradient of the Seebeck coefficient times this exponential decay of the cooling length, okay, and then you spatially integrate this. So what you have to remember is what we're probing is basically gradients of the Seebeck. And that's how we can do the inverse sometimes because then we just take the integral and then we have a, a good approximation of the Seebeck profile. <clears throat> Okay, so um, this was all back then. We looked into encapsulated graphene. We didn't see plasmons in the photocurrent. Then we almost gave up. Um, why uh, did we believe that it, wa it was actually good to look at plasmons with photocurrent? Because a graphene plasmon decays into hot carriers for 80%, at least at room temperature, I think. At low temperature, it's more phonons, as Dimitri Basov showed. But a lot of the decay product of the plasmon is heat. So why don't we use it, right? We, uh, or maybe also for energy harvesting, uh, but also for detection. Um, then we thought, okay, let's make a very well-defined sharp junction, uh, launch plasmons, and if these plasmons decay, they uh, will at some point hit this junction and then generate a photoresponse. Or the plasmon decays into heat and heat diffuses to the junction and generates a, plas uh, a photoresponse, right? So, um, so this was the experiment. So this was now a well-defined junction with a split gate where the gap between the gates is very small. So there's a very strong jump in the Seebeck coefficient. So the gradient of the Seebeck is very large. We do now photocurrent mapping. Now there is, okay, this is a scale, this is microns, but if the, you know, you see a very thin line here, and this is the uh, photoresponse at the PN junction, now with photocurrent nanoscopy, and it looks like a line, okay, as expected. But if you, so still no plasmons, right? But if you zoom in uh, at the edge, so here's again the line, we zoom in near the edge, and near the edge, we saw oscillations, okay? And then we were initially surprised, actually, because the oscillations are actually very clear, um, and we, we were worried that this would be smeared out completely by this 
electronic cooling length and the diffusion and all of that, right? But you can see very clearly the oscillations. And actually, the signal to noise in some cases is even better than scattering SNOM. Frank, short question. Yeah. Does indirect illumination play a role in these uh, measurements? So it's, of course, the, the, the nano focus from the tip, but. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I, I should have mentioned this clearly, more clearly. So the way this measurement is done is that we, we lock into the tip modulation frequency. So, the, so the, we don't see the background there. Uh, well, sometimes there is, of course, some background from the tip, tip reflection, etc. But it's, uh, it's relatively weak. You can see that, uh, that, that you can see that by here that the background here is, is nearly zero. Um, okay, here you can see the uh, experimental data, and, uh, and you can see in the many fringes here, they, they you know, they are more than 10. Um, and, and okay, so how can we model this now, and why is this happening near the edge? So um, you, you can basically see this now as the plasmon as the heat source, okay? But the heat source is coming from the plasmon interference, right? Because the plasmon launched by the tip, reflected, Pablo explained it. Um, and uh, when they coherently interfere, then um, there is more heat produced than when they um, destructively interfere. Yeah, you can uh, understu understand this basically from wavefronts of the plasmon, and then from that you can calculate the decay heat, uh, and in that way you can perfectly model uh, the heat generation from this plasmon that oscillates near the edge. Uh, and all of the details are in this paper, also from Mark Lundeberg. So that you can calculate this very well. Um, it was not predicted, but we were very excited. We can see plasmons in this way. Um, for infrared, this is nice, but, but you can use scattering for, for terahertz. This turned out to be very useful. Um, <clears throat> and this was... I'm sorry, there are some old slides here, so sometimes it says in print, but 2016. <laughs> I was collecting some you know, old slides yesterday. Um, this is uh, work with Pablo. Um, uh, the measurements are also done in Nanaguna because they had the gas laser. Later on, we also bought the gas laser. Now we have three gas lasers, actually. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and for terrors, this works beautifully. Okay, so here you can see uh, same PN junction, same device actually. Uh, you see these oscillations near the edge. This is a 3D image of the data, uh, and it's quite amazing, right? The signal to noise is amazing. Um, this is now the gas laser in our lab. My kids, uh, the, the, he is now 11 years old, okay? So uh, this is uh, already quite a couple of years ago. But think of it, right? This is the huge gas laser, three meters long, coupled into the NEA SNOM, um, and then uh, locally, uh, a spot of 20 nanometers generating this, this heat source, right? And then you can see terahertz plasmons. I find it fantastic, right? Uh, that this is all possible. We, we did not predict that this would work. Huh? <clears throat> I think for the students, it's like, uh, I always tell them, when, uh, when, you, when you believe that something does not work or your supervisor says it will not work, you should try it because there's a good chance it will work. If your supervisor says, this will for sure work, usually it doesn't, okay? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here you can see, you can measure now for different frequencies. Um, one, one thing that we found here with terahertz plasmons um, is that, first of all, the dispersion is linear. Pablo just explained to you that uh, plasmons graphene are square root of k is linear. This is because there is actually a gate close by, and, and the wavelength of the plasma is much larger, and then, then you get basically screening of the plasma by the metal, and you can see this as, a, as an image, as a mirror image. So you can actually see it as two layers of graphene, where, um, where the excitation has exactly the opposite polarity. Uh, and, 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 and this is called a screened plasma, and this leads to a linear plasma dispersion, also called acoustic plasma. So, um, uh, this acoustic plasmon, as you can see, has also a velocity that's much smaller than the typical uh, graphene plasmon. And then what we saw is that we could slow it down to a very small velocity. A velocity um, that is 
close to the electron Fermi velocity. And then uh, we came up with this picture here, which is uh, uh, this image here is basically showing the electron surfing the wave. Okay, so when you go surfing, you you pedal right really fast. And why you do that, right? Because you want to obtain the same velocity as the wave, and then the wave catches you, right? If you don't know this, go surfing because this is a good place. Right? You have to be there, okay? Um, and, and it's really the same thing with electrons, okay? So if you have electrons in a plasmonic system, and they have similar velocity, they start to move together. And this has important implications. So this is something we could see using the photocurrent nanoscopy. Um, I won't have time to go into too much detail, uh, but uh, why is this important? Because in that regime, the non-local conductivity of the material system becomes important. <clears throat> and what does that mean? So typically when we think of conductivity, it's called sigma here, uh, or even permittivity, we think of it, you know, that something that just spatially varies, right? Um, and if you take now the Fourier transform, it just has a spectrum as a function of omega. Now, uh, it turns out that the non-local conductivity, let's just look in, in Fourier space, has a momentum dependence. And usually we ignore that. Same thing with permittivity. So usually we ignore the momentum dependence of the permittivity. Um, but it turns out that this is actually... Uh, quite strong for these terahertz plasmons. This, this is relevant because it actually measures uh, the direct dynamical screening function of the system and in solid state physics. Uh, there are lots of uh, theory papers on this topic because you can learn really about the quantum theory of the electron liquid, which is the title of this book written by Giovanni um, uh, Vignale. Now, um, So, so without giving you the full equations, I'm just giving you the picture. This is, uh, th this is what it looks like. So if you have a usual plasmon, it is like this, right? So you have a wave, and that consists of some shaking of electrons, okay? And the electrons are just shaking a little bit. Um, but now, if we go to the terahertz, and we slow down the plasmon, so now the plasmon is very slow, you can see, just look at one of the electrons, okay? Put your eye on this one. You can see when this electron is moving forward, it's moving at the same velocity as the plasmon. And then it moves back again, of course, it oscillates. But this is, this is the picture, okay? And then these non-local effects kick in. Um, and the condition is basically that the velocity of the electron, Fermi velocity, divided by frequency, is equal to the plasmon wavelength. Okay, so you can already see that uh, you need very small frequency omega for that in order to reach that uh, regime. Okay, now, uh, this is something we could see in the data. So if we measure the terahertz plasmon velocity as a function of doping, you slow it down all the way to the uh, Fermi velocity. You see, this is very nicely how you can measure the velocity of the plasmon, and then here it hits the electron velocity, and then you can see that the classical theory is the dashed line, and the red curve here is the quantum theory, which fits really well with the data. And so from this, you can learn about the system. I will skip this, is work with Marco Plini. You can learn about the compressibility of the system, and Fermi velocity renormalization effects, etc. And we're actually applying this now at low temperature, um, to see more correlated effects. I think Dimitri is looking also at hydrodynamic effects. So, so this, this will follow up. Okay, now I want to move on. Um, just uh, some other things you can do with photocurrent nanoscopy. So uh, you can look also at phonon polaritons. So this is just graphene encapsulated in HBN. It turned out that uh, if you have the split gate and you launch phonon polaritons, as Pablo showed, they, they behave like these rays. They are absorbed in the graphene, and they can also generate a photocurrent. And then you see fringes here, which is coming from the phonon polaritons. Um, Dimitri published this work recently where they had uh, 
even in hazmat of photocurrent patterns using uh, from the hyperbolic phonon uh, polaritons. And this is more ray systems, which I will show you in more detail in a second, so I, I, I won't go into too much detail here. Um, but they, they saw this splitting here, uh, which is related to the phonon polaritons. Now, um, to go to more ray systems and graphene and twisted graphene, you need to go to low temperature. So we bought a cryo SNOM. Uh, this was uh, actually uh, around COVID time. This was just before COVID, okay? So uh, uh, Khaled Karai even came to our lab to help installing it, um, uh, uh, together, of course, with the other people from Neaspec. We were very happy. Um, then uh, COVID hit, so the lab shut down. Then uh, <laughs> Neaspec people couldn't fly to Barcelona, and so we had some challenges to get it to work. Um, but uh, thanks to Niels Hasp, uh, we, got it, we got it to work, and, but we're using it mostly for photocurrent right now because it's uh, uh, producing a lot of interesting data and easier to operate. Um, look in the thesis of Niels Hasp because there are some tricks actually that are useful for the cryosnom. One of them is actually active damping. So uh, our system is not in the basement, so we do suffer from building uh, vibrations. And, and Niels came up with this active damping, which is basically big pieces of metal, very heavy. And uh, on the bottom, there's a piezo. Uh, and there we have an accelerometer sitting on the ground somewhere. And then with active feedback, is actually compensating the uh, uh, vibrations. Exactly, it's 16 hertz, which is the eigenfrequency of this cryosnom. So that helped a lot. Uh, and so eventually Niels got this to work and we're producing interesting data, a couple of papers and a review related to twisted two-dimensional materials. Now, twisted materials. Um, Adrian, do I still have time? Because, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, twisted materials create more pattern, right? Uh, a periodic pattern. You can see it in this PowerPoint image. You see this periodic modulation. Um, and electrons feel this periodic modulation, and that changes the band structure of the system. And in the case of HBN and MOR3, it changes the polaritonic properties. But here I'm talking about the electronic properties, right? Now, this became a, a, a big thing because of superconductivity and magnetism that were discovered. Um, so initially, we were just looking at this system with a, cry with a SNOM and cryosnom. Um, different angles, um, and so one thing that is relevant here is when when uh, when you change the angle of the system, uh, lattice relaxation takes place. What does that mean? That means that actually this beautiful periodic structure that you see in PowerPoint is not a reality. Uh, the reality is that because of the system wants to minimize energy, it's going to actually um, M minimize uh, these regions here and maximize, sorry, it's going to minimize AA region, which are energetically less favorable. Um, and uh, you can see that here in this picture when you calculate the Moré pattern for different twist angle, initially it's periodic here, and now you go to smaller twist angle and you start to see more of this lattice relaxation, which then leads to triangular patterns. Okay, and you can see now the AA region is smaller and the AB region is larger, right? So AA basically means the atoms are on top of each other and AB means the atoms are not on top of each other. You can imagine that energetically uh, the system wants to be more an AB, right? <clears throat> so for small angle this, this happens, for larger angle this doesn't happen because it periodically varying so rapidly that it will cost the, the system too much energy to reconstruct. So you get these triangles. Now, if you look um, with photocurrent nanoscopy, this was published uh, not too long ago. Also, Dimitri Basov, similar data. Uh, you do now this scanning near field map. It doesn't, it doesn't go that fast. Huh? So in, in practice, it takes a little bit longer. Um, now you can see uh, in the photocurrent these triangular patterns, 
And you see also periodic structure is changing, right? Here you have very large Moray unit cell, here it's smaller. And that means that basically spatially the twist angle is changing. Um, and you see also it's sign changes, blue and red. Um, we can understand all of that by calculating the photocurrent maps with a method that I mentioned before. Um, and uh, uh, let me actually skip this for now because I explained that already. Um, but but this, this is something that uh, is important. I showed you already that the current field lines right, uh, are important. And they are different when I use different contacts. So between contact one and three, current field lines look like this. Okay. But, uh, and between contact two and one, they look like this. And if I have now a C-back uh, coefficient that is shown here in yellow, then it's actually the projection of this current field line on this C-back profile that matters. Okay? Because I'm probing again the gradient of the C-back. Yeah? So that's why when I measure with two different contacts, I get a different spatial profile. And this is now a calculation, and this is the uh, experiment here. Okay, sorry, now the calculation on the left, on the right side is the, the, uh, the experiment. So we can really understand very well uh, this, this system, right? And then really learn about spatial variations um, of the, of the Seebeck profile. Okay, um, that was nice, but the excitement in twisted graphene is magic angle, okay? Uh, what does magic angle mean? That is the, the, the twist angle of 1.1 degree, and that's where the system becomes magnetic and superconducting, and uh, other correlated phases have been discovered, like churn insulators. And, and that's basically where the velocity of the electrons is not anymore a Dirac cone, like shown here, but it's actually a flat band, which means the electrons are basically uh, in a standstill, they're quasi-localized. Okay, so that um, was the discovery in 2018 by the MIT group. There's so many emergent phases later on by different groups. Um, <clears throat> also, Wigner crystallization has been observed in twisted two-dimensional superconductors, uh, uh, semiconductors. Spin triplet superconductivity has been seen in tri-layer graphene systems, ferromagnetism, etc. Okay, but the, the system has one challenge, which is that there are spatial variations of uh, twist angle and strain. So nanoscopy is important, and I think this is uh, perfect for our system. Also, infrared and terahertz is ideal, because infrared light excites in this magic angle graphene between the ground state and the remote band here, 100 milliEV, and terahertz actually excites between the flat bands. Uh, and I can't show you the data, but we have very exciting results here for the terahertz, where we can see uh, the full evolution of the correlated states that are happening in these flatbeds, in, in, in photocurrent, also in near field. Um, but the most basic thing to initially look at is just, again, the Seebeck, right? And the Seebeck and twisted magic angle graphene is a bit more interesting, because in addition to the usual sign change that I showed you before, there's another peak here, uh, and uh, the horizontal axis is actually filling. This means filling one. And filling one that actually means that in my moray, I have one electron in each moray. In practice, it's four because of valley and spin degeneracy, but forget about this, so let's just say about one electron. Um, so you can see this moray is an egg basket, right? And when I put one electron in each of those baskets, then I have full filling, and the system becomes insulating. Actually, I fill this band, then there's a gap here, um, and that's why the peak uh, in the Seebeck emerges. Another very exciting direction, so I'm, I'm finishing now, another very exciting direction, I think, and, and Dimitri did some initial work on that, is uh, the fact that you can have other photocurrent mechanisms that are related to the uh, topology of the system. And I think many of you are familiar with Berry curvature, okay, which is, a, is, is an intrinsic material property. 
Then there's other topological phenomena that are related to Berry curvature dipole, okay? But there's also uh, a quantum metric, which is also an interesting, uh, an intrinsic, let's call it topological property that is less well known. But all of these different topological properties can generate photocurrents. Uh, and the only requirement is that your material breaks inversion symmetry. Sorry, it's not the only requirement. It's a minimum requirement. So in many quantum materials, this is the case. It's actually also the case in twisted graphene. It's a chiral system, so inversion symmetry is broken. Um, but also in wild semi-metals, and, and you can see here many of the uh, topological materials are mentioned here. And then for different symmetry breakings, there are different mechanisms. So here it shows the inversion symmetry breaking, which is the case in uh, all of these. But then if you break time reversal symmetry, uh, like in these two, you also get different photocurrent mechanisms. Um, so in that way, you can even use it as a probe to, to measure the symmetry breaking in the system, and then hopefully with nanoscale spatial resolution. And we have some initial data on that as well, but there's also a paper from uh, Dimitri from, I don't know, what, last year or something like that, right? Uh, where they uh, saw also nonlinear photocurrents in uh, wild semi-metal that is uh, explained by these um, uh, by this picture that I showed you here. And now I want to finish. Thank Be you very much. Thank you, Frank. Questions? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned um, using the technique on nanowires, and I'm in, intrigued to see how challenging it is to use it for um, a single nanowire as, as a photodetector. And is that sensitive to the antenna geometry? Uh, I mean, the contact, right. whether it was a uh, straight line or a uh, bow-tie kind of thing, then bridging the gap. And given the spot size, and now, is that also sensitive to um, your nanowire shape, if it's cylindrical shape kind of stuff? And follow up to that question also, what prior knowledge I should have for a nanowire? Because many factors come into the play, fabrications, given that. Is there any analysis that or um, characterization I should do before resorting to kind of mapping out the photocurrent? Which material nanowires are you working with? It's uh, cadmium arsenide. Okay, so... Which is not a quite semiconductor, but it could behave as a... Yes. Um, so it's not difficult because uh, I, I assume you deposit on the substrate, right? Yeah. So... Um, of course, contacting wires is always challenging, but it's a separate story, so I'm not going to talk about that. But uh, imaging them with nanoscopy is, is very easy. So I've actually also done it on germanium nanowires uh, before this work. Um, and um, um, if you use far field, you will have antenna effects, okay? So near the contacts, if you have the polarization perpendicular to the contact, you get an enhancement of the signal. But if you use an anoscopy, you don't have that because your antenna is really the tip, right? So then uh, you just have to make sure you don't scan over the contact, but if you stay on the wire, you can very nicely measure the uh, potential profile in the, in the nanowire, especially if you have a gate. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my question is, did you try a nanoscopy of uh, multi-layer graphene with different staking orders to resolve the boundaries, like A, B, ah. C, A, B, C, D? Uh, yes, uh, we did, uh, uh, but Dimitri actually published papers on that topic, so they do see... Um, uh, this was, I think, tri-layer graphene, right? They did tri-layer graphene, there are different stacking orders, right? A, B, C, and uh, A, B, A, uh, and that uh, gives... A different, I think, also give a different scattering signal. So you can you can even see it in scattering in that case. But in photocurrent, I'm sure you will also see it because the Seebeck coefficient is different. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you. Very nice talk. Um, just a question about the probing volume. Uh, is it different in the case of with respect to SNOM, for example? Can you probe more more volume? I'm asking because, like for example, in these twisted materials, sometimes uh, you can have like a top layer which is thicker, so the your more pattern is really literally buried. So is it uh, something that uh, can you comment yes. on? So when we encapsulate graphene with HBN and we want to see plasmons and scattering, um, we have to make the top HBN thinner than 10 nanometers okay, in scattering. If you use photocurrent, we can live with a little bit thicker HBN. So um, it's not fully understood why, but I think the simplest picture here is like, in both cases, you still have just the volume of your hotspot, right? But with scattering, you have a double process, so very inefficient, right? And with photocurrent, there's only one process, in, and then it goes in the graphene, right? So you have a little bit, you can bury it a little bit more. Okay, uh, just uh, further comment. Uh, are you demodulating the signal somehow? Like yeah, just with the tip frequency. The tip frequency, okay. Yeah. So you, the, like the signal that you showed are like demodulated that uh, they are higher harmonics of the tips? No, it's just the, the, the harmonic uh, just, of the tip. Okay, yeah. okay. thank you. Thank you, Frank, for the nice talk. I was wondering about temperatures. So for addressing or to see all these uh, phenomena on twist graphene layers, what temperature should we operate? I mean, can we see this at room temperature or it needs to be very low temperature? Yeah, so for example, this, you definitely need low temperature. As I mentioned to you yesterday at dinner, um, look at these flat bands, right? Uh, they are as flat as like 10 milliEV. And KT room temperature is 30 milliEV. So at room temperature, these bands are filled. Well, strictly speaking, half filled because it's a, it's, it's a thermal distribution. But the gate does very little, okay? So, um, so you don't see any more... Uh, for example, uh, these, these full filling peaks, right? It's completely smeared out, right? So any paper that claims at room temperature to see effects of quarter filling and three quarter filling in, in twisted graphene, that is complete nonsense, okay? And there was a paper in Nature that was actually claiming that. Uh, so I, 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 that's just not possible at room temperature. And that, that's really basic, uh, basic physics, right? So the, the flat bands are that flat, so yeah. That, that's apart from correlated states, right? That's just filling the bands, right? Of course, for correlated states, you usually need lower temperature. Um, however, in, in bilayer graphene aligned on HBN, also room temperature uh, effects have been seen now uh, that are, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, due to the Moray pattern. Okay, but Frank, that's a different system. Yeah. Frank, are there any practical aspects that you could share? Let's say somebody wants to do these measurements. Could you give some advices to avoid any mistakes in, in doing such? Um, yeah, so, um, so, so typically we have a, so what, what, what you should do for sure is go to the thesis of, of Niels Hasp, so it's, it's, it's all written there. So we, we typically use a nice circuit board to make sure that we have low noise uh, collection of the currents, right? So we have coax lines connected to a circuit board with a chip carrier, and that's just in the NEA spec system, right? That's one thing. But then those, those coax lines just go to a current amplifier, nothing special. Um, and then the uh, lock-in measurement, you can do with your own lock-in, but you can also do with a lock-in that's already in the NEA spec system. So you just feed the amplified current, um, the current amplifier, the output just goes into the uh, NEA spec electronic system, whereas the lock-in, uh, and, th and that already modulates at the tip frequency. So, so that's relatively uh, easy. So I would pay most attention to the electronic wiring uh, and, and a stable circuit board that you can mount on the system. And, and the design of that is in the thesis of, of Niels Hasp, so. Thank you, thank you for sharing this. Yes, yeah. Okay, one more question from Vladimir and then we go to coffee. Just a very short one. 
nanoscopy, it looks uh, si <coughs> similar to visual uh, near field scattering, but uh, there is no phase. Is there any way to get this phase information or like additional measurements? Uh, or um, well, uh, so we do get photocurrent in phase because it's tip modulated, so we do get you know, amplitude and phase information. Um, and I actually, we're using it. <clears throat> we are using it. Um, we are using it to um, because because the system has a, 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 a capacitive component as well. So you get a complex uh, photo response. Okay, so because resistive part and the capacitive part. And, and we're using it now to actually understand more about the system. Um, but it's very different from the phase that you're used to with <coughs> optics, right? So with polariton. So, um, so for example, for the polariton imaging, uh, there is not a polariton phase that we uh, obtain. Yeah. But there is another type of phase that tells you more about the material system. So... Yeah, depends on what you want. Uh, the best is actually combined scattering and photocurrent. Huh? So, so those images are produced at the same time, huh? the photocurrent and scattering. Huh? So, the, so you always have both. So in our lab, we always measure both. So there's no reason to, well, unless you don't have contacts, right? But if you have contacts, why not just probing it, right? Maybe you'll see something in one and not in the other. Huh? Let's thank Frank again. Okay. <laughs> and